I had the privilege this morning of wrapping up the third and final uh, membership class for the folks that are intending to join or potentially attending to join our church. And uh, I'm, I'm excited not only because it's the largest group in four years that I've ever had the privilege of, of uh, leading through the membership class, but because the group is so great. Uh, there's just such tremendous people that the Lord has been uh, leading to this church, and I'm just so thankful for the chance for my life uh, to intersect with theirs. And so uh, it, in, the, in the couple of weeks, you'll get a chance to welcome uh, hopefully all of them into the fellowship of this church and, and uh, begin a, a new relationship as uh, brothers and sisters of Christ who belong uh, together here at this church, and I'm really excited about that. I have a question. How many of you like to read novels? We have any novel readers? Okay, a good bit of you. Uh, it's hard to beat a good story, isn't it? Um, I, I think my favorite stories are the kinds where the, the author knows exactly how uh, to set things up to kind of lead you to where they want you to go, right? They, they craft the novel in a way that has you just anticipating what's coming next. What's, what's going to happen next? Where are you going with this? You, you, you see the, 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 di- the different pieces of the puzzle, and as you get towards the end of the story, all the puzzle pieces start to come together in ways that perhaps you didn't even expect. Uh, those are my favorite kinds of stories. Um, back when the, the, the Hunger Games books were out by Suzanne Collins, one of the things that my wife and I both experienced as we read through those was how not only did Suzanne Collins know how to get you looking forward to the next thing, but she had a way of getting you most excited right at the end of a chapter so that you had to start the next chapter. You couldn't stop there. It drove me crazy. I'd be trying to read this book before I would go to bed, and I couldn't go to sleep because I had to know what happened next. Uh, those are the best kinds of stories for me, the ones that I really like to, the ones I really enjoy reading. Now, if we were reading through Mark from the beginning for the first time ever, Imagine coming to Mark with a clean slate. You had no idea anything going on uh, in this story, and you're reading it for the first time. If you were making your way through, you would get to chapter 14, and you would start to feel like, maybe not for the first time, but definitely perhaps more than ever before, that something is about to happen. For several chapters now, this, there's been a, t- a growing tension. It's, it's been one of those things that's been signaled by the direction of Jesus' travels. He's, he's headed south. The last two weeks, we saw where he began to set his face towards Jerusalem. Then last week, we saw where he actually was on his way to Jerusalem. And here in chapter 14, he has already arrived. He arrived back in chapter 12, and he's, he's, he's cleared the temple. He's uh, confronted the Pharisees and the religious leaders. He's, he's taught some parables. And chapter 13, or I'm sorry, chapter 12, uh, no, I'm sorry, chapter 13 was all about this whole idea of, of looking ahead into the future and, and, and being a people who, who anticipate, who expect, who are watchful. And then you get to chapter 14. And you really start to get this sense that things are coming, coming to a head. All the movement, all the prophecy, all the predictions, all the trajectory of Mark's gospel seems to be finally coming together. And you get that indication in the first couple of verses as you see that there's this emerging conspiracy to capture and to kill Jesus. You feel like something is about to happen. So let's actually turn there to chapter 14. I'm going to read the first nine verses here as Mark records them. It was now two days before Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The leading priests and the teachers of religious law were still looking for an opportunity to capture Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the Passover celebration, they agreed, or the people may riot. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with an alabaster, a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard. She broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. Some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume? they asked. It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. So they scolded her harshly. But Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, and you can help them whenever you want to. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. And I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered 
and disgust. And we're going to do just that this morning. So the scene in Mark's gospel has shifted from the temple where there, there's growing tension, this growing escalation of conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders. It has now shifted from the temple to the house of a man named Simon, who, as Mark indicates, was formerly a leper. And that's significant, particularly to me this morning, as I've been thinking about this sermon series for, for weeks now, and we've been working through uh, the, this, this series in, in the second half of Mark. And if you will recall, as we, if we went back to the series prior, which was sort of the, the companion to this one over the last eight, nine, ten weeks now, uh, we started with Jesus touching a leper. And so just as his, his story for our purposes on Sunday mornings began with, with touching a leper, proximity, contact with a leper, now it's winding uh, down to a close with the same type of interaction. These are the ones Jesus has come to touch and be touched by. Now, it is here where we're introduced to this anonymous woman. Now, we know uh, probably from the, the, the parallel account in John, it's probably the same account. We don't know for sure, but it's most likely the same account. And if so, then we're looking at Mary, the sister of Lazarus here. But in Mark's gospel, she remains anonymous. And, and all four of the gospels have some account similar to this. It's, it's possible that they're all the same account. More likely than not, the one recorded in Luke was a different one. But my, my purpose this morning is not to try to reconcile the differences and sort through all those textual uh, questions. I'm interested in, in how Mark places this story within his broader narrative. Because what he does here in chapter 14 is he sandwiches her between these ones in verses 1 and 2 who are conspiring and plotting to capture and kill Jesus. And then again with with the, the, the account of Judas beginning in verse 10, who would go on to betray Jesus. So somewhere between capture, kill, and betrayal, you have this woman and her actions that apparently were objectionable to those in Simon's house. Now, what did she do that was so bad? Why was she rebuked? Why was she criticized, as Mark says here, why was she scolded harshly? Well, according to those around the table reclining with Jesus, she has wasted an entire jar of expensive perfume. Now, to you and me, that may not seem like that big of a deal, right? So you have your, okay, so you have your guess. Do they still make guess cologne? I don't even know. I don't wear cologne. Uh, I'm a body spray kind of guy. So I don't do the, per, the cologne or in, in, in perf, my wife and I, we, we're not into the perfumes or, yeah, we don't do perfume. You do the body spray too. So we're body spray people. Something I never thought I was going to share with you until just now. That came out of nowhere. All right, we're not into cologne or, or perfumes. But um, it's hard for us to try to, to, to really understand the gravity of this moment because none of us have anything quite like this. I mean, this is a very rare, very precious, very exotic import that you can only get from one place in the world. It comes from a plant that's only grown in one place in the world. This is a, a really expensive jar of, of perfume, of oil. And, it's, and we know from the text that it, it was worth about a year's worth of wages. Now, I did a little bit of research. I did my homework. I checked out uh, from the good old IRS. What was the, the median income in the U.S. last year? Well, according to the IRS, it was about $59,000, $59,039. Now, whether, whether you make $25,000 a year or $250,000 a year, I think you can agree with me that taking an entire year of your wages and, and using it like this in an instant, in a moment, it sounds like a really tough thing to do, doesn't it? Could you imagine doing that? Blowing a whole, I see some of the workers, the people who work really hard and you're like, yep, <laughs> I can imagine taking a whole year of my work and, and, and giving it away in an, in an instant like this. It's hard to connect with that. And so naturally, some there at the table saw what she was doing, and the, there's that word again, they became indignant. There's a, a moral outrage over her actions. I cannot believe what she has done. And these are probably the same, the same ones who have been missing what Jesus is all about all throughout Mark, right? They're the ones who are, who are preventing the little ones to come to Jesus. They were the ones who were rebuking Jesus when he talked about who he, was, who he was and what it meant for their lives. They were the ones that were arguing over who was greatest, who was best. They all declined. They all said, no, none of us would betray him. There's no way it would be me. They were the ones that are indignant when Jesus dared to suggest 
that they might have to suffer just like he suffered or he was going to suffer. And just like all the times before, they earn a loving rebuke from their Lord. It's interesting. For the first time, on the surface at least, it appears as though their response is not self-centered on the surface. I mean, after all, they seem to be concerned for the poor. Imagine that what we could do for the poor if if instead of wasting this bottle on Jesus, we could have just taken it out there and sold it and taken a year's worth of wages and helped all the people that we could. That seems legitimate, doesn't it? I mean, they're not arguing over who is greatest at this point. They're not rebuking Jesus for for claiming that he's going to suffer and die. They're, they're, They're concerned about others. Think of the good we could do. And yet Jesus puts things in perspective for them as well as for us. Because no matter what they sound like on the surface, the truth of the matter is this. They were missing the larger significance of the moment because they were missing Jesus altogether. And if you're like me, you don't want to miss him either. You don't want to miss what's, what's going on. You don't want to miss what he's all about, what all this means for your life and for mine. And so I want to ask, what can we take away from this story this morning? And I have three very short points. The first is this. It's amazing to me that Jesus is moved by the actions of this woman. We we just spent the last half hour offering our praises to God. We're joining all of creation. I'm so grateful for a music minister who, who knows how to lead us to worship. And I worshiped this morning with the help of God and the direction of Jeff and the the worship team. I worshiped this morning. And what's beautiful about that is he receives our worship. He receives her gesture, what she has to offer. He accepted. She wasn't offering some slavish, robotic submission, some things she felt like she had to do or she was going to be ground to a pulp. He's not interested in that type of response. He doesn't want to evoke that kind of response from us. Instead, she offers him a genuine, spontaneous expression of her love and adoration. The verb there for for what she does to the jar is not that she she just cracked the seal and dripped it out on his head. No, the the picture here is, is of her crushing this jar and extravagantly pouring it out. All of its contents, every bit of it was 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 drained over the head of Jesus and and John on all over his feet. From his head to his feet, this perfume was lavished upon his body. And I can't help but read that and be taken back to chapter chapter 2. When you you have another breaking in the text, it was when those guys had a friend who was crippled and they, they wanted to get to Jesus, but the house was packed. There was standing room only as Pastor Aaron preached. And so what did they do? They broke through the roof, didn't they? And they didn't just pick one piece apart here and pick one piece apart there so it could be nice and neat and clean. No. They're they're digging. They're breaking. There's a sense of of desperation, of of being in contact with Jesus. I want to get to Jesus, be with Jesus. There's this, the circumstances compelled them to be with this one who alone could touch and bring healing and restoration to this man's life. They would do whatever it takes to connect with Jesus. And as so often, for those of us who are sincerely attempting to connect with Jesus, we end up being kind of messy, don't we? We make a mess, and we're we're clumsy, and we're awkward, and, and sometimes even disruptive. And yet, despite our imperfection and our inability to do things perfectly and cleanly and neatly, Jesus accepts us. He accepts us. He makes room in his heart for you and me. Now, too often, I am unmoved by others. Too often, I resist or or am even unwilling to make room in my heart for someone else. Because after all, it's, it's a lot of work to do that, isn't it? It's a lot of work to carve out space in your life and in your time and in your heart for other people and their stuff. But not with Jesus. Jesus is not unmoved by circumstances. Jesus is not resistant to accepting us. Jesus says, bring your your broken jars. Bring your messiness. Bring your inadequacies. Bring your stuff. 
I make room in my heart for you. And he desires for us to do the same for him. He desires for us to make, to carve out space in our hearts for him. That's his desire. He says in John that just as the Father, he says this about himself, as the Father is in me, I want you to be in me. And guess what else? I want to be in you. That's what it means to be a person. That's what it means to have real life, to experience everything God has in store for all of creation is for him to abide in us and for us to abide in him. To make room in our hearts for another as he has done for us. He wants us to be a people who, like him, not just make room in our hearts for for God, but for others as well. The disciples are incapable of this at this point. All that they've been able to do is focus on themselves and what they want. There's no room in their hearts for another. Their hearts are completely full of themselves. That's all they can think about, all they can talk about. It, It motivates all of their decisions and all of their actions. And yet this woman stands in contrast to them all. She's empty of herself. The the jar is a a tangible, external expression of what is in here. It's a symbol. And just as the smell of this this essence of nard pleased the nostrils of those around the table, I believe that her gesture of love and adoration and self-giving to Jesus was a fragrant aroma to God. However messy, however clumsy, however irresponsible her actions seemed to be, they were pleasing to Jesus. He received what she had to give. He allows himself to be touched. (laughs) He makes room in his hearts, in his heart for us. I think, secondly, what moves Jesus in this moment is just the simple authenticity of it. It's not the, whether it was a practical thing to do. I mean, you can make a really strong case that it was a very impractical thing to do. The disciples have one thing right here. Hey, this could have been used for many good things. There's no question about that. He's not impressed with the show of the moment. You know as well as I do, Jesus isn't interested in the, the show, the presentation. He's not concerned with the things on the outside. I think what moves Jesus most here, the thing that that matters most, is that she was just real. There's nothing contrived. There's no manipulation. It's the exact opposite of everything the disciples have been up to this point. She stands to gain nothing from this. There's no jostling for position. There's no jockeying. There's no, please let me, if I do this to you, then maybe you'll let me sit here or you'll let me sit here. She has nothing to gain, a whole year's worth of wages to lose. And it seems like the only thing that she has to show for her actions is the criticism of everybody in attendance. (laughs) But she was real. She was real. And I think that's what Jesus wants from us. He wants the real you. Not the fake you. Not the you that you might have put on for church this morning. The you that you put on for your, your coworkers, or the people that you want to impress, the people that you think you don't want to in any way have them to look down on you, so you put on the best you, the, sometimes the fake you. Jesus doesn't want that. He wants the real you. He, he doesn't want the Pharisee. He wants the leper. He wants the harlot, the cripple. All of us in his presence, stand equally fallen, equally broken, equally in need, but only those who recognize it, only those who recognize it, that they are broken and are in need of him, only they enjoy life in him. As Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the poor in spirit. Not just blessed are the poor, but blessed are those who, are, who recognize that in their hearts they are empty, There's nothing in here that is of value. I am broken in spirit. I need him. Jesus says, blessed are they, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Those who know the depths of their own poverty and realize their need of Jesus, he says, will see God. He rewards you for your realness. And you may have things in your past that you're embarrassed about. You may have things in your past that you think disqualify you from being a a target, an object of his love and his adoration. 
You think that he would never accept the real you. If anyone else could see who you really were, they would absolutely agree that there's no way Jesus would accept you like that. But Jesus does. He accepts you as you are. The promise of Scripture is that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. And that's a word of good, of good news for you today. You don't have to fix things first. You don't have to be clean and right and have all the, the, the pieces of your life, the, the puzzle of your life in, in order before Jesus makes room in his heart for you. He takes you where you are as you are. The real you. He just wants you to be real with him today. No more facade. No more pretense. No more face. He just wants your heart. One of my favorite books of all time. It's a devotional written by the late and great Dennis Kinlaw, This Day with the Master. And I have one of the early uh, editions of it, the earliest, I think the earliest run that was produced. And I think my favorite page in the entire devotional is the, the page in the beginning where he, where he dedicates it to his wife, Elsie. It's a very simple dedication. It's so precious to me. And it says this, to Elsie, whom next to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I like most and am indebted to. That terminology, that phraseology has always, has always interested me. And in fact, in a discussion with his, his uh, grandson, Billy, one time, I went to seminary with, with Kinlaw's grandson. Uh, Billy and I were talking about this dedication. And he said that because the, that phrase, whom I like most, was so strange that in later editions of the devotional, the language was changed to love. They changed, the editors changed it from like to love. Because for some reason, saying I like her just for some reason doesn't make sense to people. But to me, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, you can love someone without liking them, can't you? Yeah. In fact, we're all called to that. There's no commandment to, to like one another, is there? The commandment is to love one another. And that's what the Holy Spirit produces in our hearts, is hearts that are selfless and turned out towards other, and e even the ones that are obnoxious and loud and rude and mean, and even our enemies, we can love because of the grace of God. But Kinlaw is saying something more than that. I think it's assumed he loves his wife. He's saying, I like her. She satisfies me. She completes the, the, the story of my life. And I enjoy her. It brings me pleasure to spend time with her, with all of her imperfections and all the ways she misses the mark and even the times that she has failed me and, and, and spouses. Your spouse will always fail you in some way or another. No one can live up perfectly to the expectations of marriage. But you're saying, in spite of all that, I love my wife and I like my wife. And dare I say this morning, that Jesus likes you. Obviously, he loves you. He gave his life to prove his love for you. But I'm telling you, he likes you. He enjoys you as you are. He doesn't like, he doesn't like your sin. <laughs> he has no intention of letting that stick around in your life. He wants to eradicate that from your life. But he likes you. He enjoys you. He takes pleasure in you. Lastly, what I see significant in this text is in the life of this woman, in the acts of this woman, we see the instincts of a true disciple. Now, last week we started out the story where, you know, Jesus is, is he's heading to Jerusalem, and, and Mark tells us he's out in front of his disciples, right? He's out in front. There's, there's a growing distance between him and, and the rest of them. And so they were they were definitely walking behind Jesus, but I don't think you could say they were following him. You see the difference, right? They were behind him, but in their hearts, I don't think they were really following him. But I think this woman was. I think she gets Jesus. 
She may not understand all the theological statements. She may not have memorized the creeds. She may not have all the liturgy down, right? All the yeses and nos and do's and don'ts and rights and wrongs. But she gets Jesus, the person of Jesus. She's connected to him at the deepest point of who she is, at the heart level. And though her actions are clumsy and disruptive, because of her closeness to Jesus, because of her connectedness to Jesus, she instinctively does his will. It's, it's profound. She does something far beyond what she ever imagined what she was even doing in the moment. And Jesus says of her in verse, verses 6 through 8, leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor. You can help them when you want, but you won't always have me. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. Whether she knew it or not, her actions had deep meaning, deep significance for the Messiah at this point in his mission. And the disciples' actions couldn't have been further from the heart of Jesus. (laughs) Now, obviously, doing things for the poor is a great thing to do. Obviously. We should be giving to the poor. We should be giving ourselves to those who are in need. But I'm quite confident that their expression here, that that this could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor was nothing more than self-centered virtue signaling. In fact, we know from the book of John that one of the ones saying this was Judas himself, who, by the way, was a thief. To think that Judas would have the nerve to virtue signal in front of everybody, oh, this money could have been sold, or this perfume could have been sold and given to the poor. Oh, what a selfless, generous guy you are, Judas. When he's Stealing money out of the, the, the common purse for his own good. I think that's what you and I always are when our motives and our hearts are focused on ourselves. No matter how good you act, no matter how many good deeds you do, no matter how nice you are or how selfless you appear to be on the surface, if it's for you and for your glory, you're no better than Judas himself. But her actions, because they were empty of herself. Her actions were instinctively in harmony with Jesus. Somehow, through her her heart-level connection to him, she was able to imbibe the very nature and trajectory of his mission. And that made what she did in this moment, while completely impractical and on the surface made no sense to anybody, it was incredibly important. And I can promise you this morning that when your life is focused on Jesus, your, all of your actions, all of your works, every second of your day will be saturated with real meaning. When we stop doing things for how we can benefit from them and start living every moment as a genuine expression of love for Jesus, your life will actually matter forever. Verse 9, I tell you the truth. Wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. What she did mattered, even if no one else understood it, because it was empty of herself, and it was focused on him. And as your life and my life becomes connected and intertwined with the person and the work and the mission and the trajectory of Jesus, our lives will start to matter, truly matter. God doesn't want our show. He doesn't want our signals. He doesn't want our works. He wants our heart. And he has uses for our sincere acts of worship that far exceed the imagination. She had no idea. I don't think she had any idea what she was doing. She just knew that it was an expression of what was in here. And Jesus took that and made it a beautiful thing that we're still talking about today. When we come to him, as we really are, when we love him for who he really is, we will begin to live a life of consequence. Not defined by our past, our failures, or our present inadequacies, but by Jesus. He alone bestows meaning and significance to every moment of our lives when we're connected to him and when we're living for his kingdom and his glory in the world. I don't know about you, but I want to live a life of consequence. I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to just virtue signal. It's so easy to do, I'm telling you. It's so easy to want people to see your good works. 
to think what a great person you are. I fight that temptation every week in this pulpit. Every week. I have to pray, Lord, may this not be for me. It cannot be for me. It cannot be from me. Because if it is, there's nothing but death and lifelessness and destruction ahead for me and for you. Jesus, let this be about you. May this be from you and for you and in you and to you. And if we want to live lives of consequence, lives that are not defined by our mistakes and inadequacies, but by his grace, it begins with having hearts that are broken and spilled out for him. That's the starting point. And it's awkward, and it will invite criticism. I promise you, if you've never been criticized, for Jesus' sake, you will be. If your heart is as broken and crushed and poured out as hers, I promise you, you will be criticized. But let me tell you something. If you've experienced the grace of God, there is no other way to respond. Our brokenness and our crushedness for him is nothing but a response of his brokenness for you and me. The one who makes room in himself for you. The starting point is us making room in ourself for him. I want a life that is so connected, so in tune to Jesus that he actually lives his life through me. A few months ago, after one of the Sunday morning services, uh, Larry Sandin uh, snagged me and he said, you know, he was very like, thoughtful, uh, um, he- you know, sort of heady sort of way of talking. I love, I love how Larry talks. He said, you know, I was listening to you preach and you actually kind of sounded like Bill Urey. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, I spent the last decade of my life either being his student or his teaching assistant or his associate pastor. I guess when you spend that much time with someone, it's only natural that you begin to kind of take on some of their, their tendencies and you start to look and sound like them. And immediately, Jesus said to me, I want you to be that close to me, Sean. So close to me. You spend so much time, you're so exposed to me that you actually start to look like me. He wants that for your life and for mine. And if we can come to that place where we're empty of ourselves and full of him, then everything you do, every word you say, every thought you think, every second of your life will matter. Because it's not you. It's him in you. It's him in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So that's the invitation for you today. I'm going to invite Jeff. I caught him (laughs) mid-drink. As Jeff comes, I'm going to invite you to stand with me. And if you sense God calling you to a deeper place in your walk with him, a place where you're ready to be broken and spilled out at the heart level for his sake, you can come here and you can do that on your knees before the creator of the world. Or even where you're sitting or standing, you can can express to him how much you want to be empty of yourself and filled with his life. And he'll honor that prayer. I promise you that. That's That's the prayer he wants you to pray. That's the thing he wants to do. That's what all of it is about. From the manger to the grave to the, to the sky and to Pentecost. The goal of the life of Jesus was that his life would be in you as yours is in him. You can experience that right now in a, in a moment. Just as a whole year worth of wages was spilled out for Jesus from his head to his toes, your whole life can be spilled out right here in a moment. So come. Come as you will. Lord, I pray that in this time of response, you would begin to be speaking to hearts. You would be drawing people to yourself. Lord, we're not propelled forward by something in the past. We are drawn to the God of past, present, and future. You are wooing us to your, drawing us, leading us to yourself and to our future eternal destiny of life in you and with you, in you and us. Lord, may that begin for somebody today. And maybe for someone in whom that life has begun, it's become stagnant and stale and has has developed a, a layer of dust. Lord, may that be shaken off in a moment right now as lives are pledged to you, spilled out for you anew. Lord, may that that take place in this moment. And it's only because of your work in our lives. There's not we claim no glory in any of this, Lord. It's all of you and for you. We love you, Jesus, and we pray in your precious name. Amen. Respond to him as he's leading you in this time.